Head and neck injuries. Head and neck injuries. All right, picture the skull. What bones do I want you to know? I want you to know, you don't need to know all 26 bones. So I need you to know the mandible, which is the lower jaw. All right, that's where your lower set of teeth are. And what's special about the mandible? It's the only moving bone good, in the entire skull. The upper jaw is the maxilla. That's where your upper teeth are. Okay, it does not move. So know the difference between the mandible and the maxilla. Uh, there are a couple of other bones we're going to talk about. The occipital bone. This is right here at the back. The occipital bone. And the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process. I don't even know if they have it here. I'm sorry, not the xiphoid. The mastoid process. Xiphoid is in your chest. Okay, the mastoid process, which is the bone here, you can feel it, it's behind your ear. If you push down behind your ear, all right, you'll feel the mastoid process. And we'll talk about that. So these are the bones I need you to know. Everything else is icing, which is fine. If you wanna know, you know about the zygomatic bones, in your cheek or anything else. All right, we spoke, we've discussed this already, 712554. Uh, this is probably the last time that I'm going to focus on this. So know the numbers, know the words, know where they are. Um, and here's a new piece of information that the most commonly injured parts of the spine or spinal column are the CNL, cervical and lumbar regions, okay? The most commonly injured. But you must know these numbers. Nervous system, um, it's very little that you guys, you know, need to know about this. Um, anatomically, we have the CNS and the PNS. You need to know that. What is in the CNS? They will test you. They will ask you what are what makes up the CNS, and the answer is always the brain and the spinal cord. Remember, the spinal column is there to protect the spinal cord. I'm going to talk more about that now. Uh, the PNS is all the other nerves and all the other parts of the nervous system are all PNS, peripheral. But the thing they're going to test you on is the CNS. You need to know the spine, uh, spinal cord, and the brain. How they work? Well, they work in two ways. The Remember the muscles. I told you there's voluntary and there's involuntary. So voluntary is controlled by the somatic nervous system. What does that mean? That means if I want to pick up my coffee, then I will send a message from my brain using the somatic nervous system. It will go to my arm, my hand, and it will pick up the drink and hopefully bring it to my lips where I will be able to partake of. Okay, so that would be the somatic nervous system. Way more exciting is the autonomic nervous system. And this is what makes things happen seemingly by itself without your particular input. And that's known as the autonomic, sounds like automatic, right? So autonomic is the part of the uh, central nervous system that makes things happen seemingly by itself. And we have two parts of this. We have the sympathetic, which causes excitation, which is known as fight or flight, things that make you jump, things that make you run, 
right? Things that speed you up are sympathetic. The opposite of sympathetic is the parasympathetic. And this is rest and digest. Anything that you want to calm down, you want to relax, you want your food to digest properly is all done by the parasympathetic. And these two are sort of um, not at odds, but they work together that as the, the, um, as the sympathetic system gains more tone and gets stronger than the parasympathetic will relax a little bit. So it's like a scale up and down. Are these voluntary? This is involuntary. All this is involuntary. involuntary. Now, many, many, many of the medications that are prescribed, many medications and many illegal drugs uh, work on the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. And we'll talk about that another time, uh, but it's, it's very, very exciting uh, part of medicine uh, to really, you know, get into it and understand it as best that we can. All right, let's talk about the spinal cord. So the cord is inside the spinal column. This is the actual cord. This is what sends messages. It goes up all the way into the brain. Now, the spinal cord has three coverings, three coatings. And the names are pia matter, arachnoid, and dura matter. Okay? Uh, it spells pad, P-A-D, from inside to outside. Pia, arachnoid, dura matter. These three are known together as the meninges. Now, the meninges cover the entire spinal uh, cord and the brain. Okay? So it's a protective coating. And then on top of all that is the spinal column. All right? This is the spinal cord. Um, as well as that, if there is a special fluid, special liquid that is inside and it surrounds the brain and the spinal column, and it's known as CSF, CSF. And you need to know the big word, cerebrospinal fluid. That's the actual CSF. And again, it's there to protect. Uh, you may have heard of meningitis. Many people have heard of that meningitis, that's an infection within the meninges. So it could be in any of these. Um, I had, before I went away, a 15-year-old girl hit by a car crossing. She was crossing the street in the middle of the road. Her head went into the windshield, completely smashed the car's windshield. And she had what we call a subarachnoid bleed. So it's quite a common, quite a common medical word. All right, arachnoid, subarachnoid below the arachnoid. Um, now you may have heard of an epidural. You may have heard of that word. So dura comes from dura. Epi just means above. So epidura, that needle goes in to just above the dura matter. Okay, and that's an epidural. So these are, you know, these are words that are used. There can be different types of spinal cord injuries. Um, I'll show you on the next slide what we what we need to know. All right. 
So remember these three, I call them the blue people. And we will refer back to this picture when we get to uh, a later lecture, much later, but we'll refer back to it. So for now, um, we're going to look at the word paralysis. Paralysis. Paralysis means can't move, can't use that part of the body. Loss of function. So the first one is quadriplegia, which means all four limbs cannot be moved. Um, this is one of the worst spinal cord injuries uh, that a person can get. Um, it's usually very high up, C2, C3. Um, so if it doesn't kill them, it can cause quadriplegia. And that means they cannot use their arms or their legs. Um, and so all the blue would be paralyzed. Paraplegia is where the injury is lower down. Okay, it's not in the C or usually not in the T. Uh, it's usually high up in the L. And that may cause injury to the lower extremities. And then if they're paraplegic, they will not be able to use their legs at all. Not stand, not sit, not nothing. But they will have full uh, upper body function. The third picture has nothing to do with this, but because it's in neurological injury, we'll come back to this, uh, and that is a stroke. But right now we're talking about trauma and spinal cord injury. So you will not see hemiplegia from spinal cord injury. It'll either be quadriplegia or paraplegia. And of course, your PMS test will alert you to a lot of these problems. The next word is paresthesia, and that is pins and needles, numbness. It can happen from actually many different causes, but for now, we're gonna look at it as a neurological injury um, that they feel tingling or pins and needles um, somewhere in one of their extremities. So the name for that is paresthesia. All right, big slide, a lot of stuff here. Uh, signs and symptoms of neurological injury, okay? All these could be either a CNS, or a head injury. So it could be neck or head injury. Uh, the first one, or just go in order for now, is if you actually see CSF leaking from the ears or nose. You gotta remember, where is the CSF? It's in the meninges. So if that's leaking through ears or nose, that's really bad. And I'll show you how to identify CSF in, in, in another slide. Battle signs, oh, that's why we need to know the mastoid process. So man, battle signs will be bruising behind the ears. And again, it was after a, a um, head injury and you will see this bruising behind the ears right over the mastoid process. The other one can be raccoon's eyes. So here you have a raccoon at the top, and then you have the 
raccoon's eyes. So it's like two black eyes. Again, after head injury. Um, and these are signs that you could see um, showing that there was a head injury. Neurological posturing. Okay, so there's two types. It's very complicated, but I try to teach it, okay? So posturing means how do you find the patient? What position are they in? What do they look like? There are two, and you have them on the right as you're looking. Uh, the first one is where the arms are bent inwards. And it's called flexion of the upper extremities. And this is called decorticate. Um, the patient will be completely unresponsive. The arms will be locked. And you will not be able to open them. I had a case with this where I told the EMTs to get a blood pressure on one arm and I'll put an IV in the other. And neither of us could move. Couldn't open the patient's arm. Couldn't move it from that position. And that is the corticate. And I'm just saying that they don't live. They, you know, he lasted maybe 10 days. Um, worse than that, the cerebrate, where you see that now, instead of flex, we have extended arms and usually pointing outwards. Um, again, they will be unresponsive. They will have had a head injury. Um, and both are really, really bad. Both are really bad. So that's called the cerebrate. The first one is the cortica. They won't test you on these ones. Cushings, I've got a different slide on. Seizures. Okay, we'll get to another day. Nausea, unequal pupils. I got a slide on that. Neurogenic shock, you should know what that is. You should know what that is. One of the distributive shocks. If you don't know, you need to go study. because That will be on your tests coming up, I think. Shock. Respiratory arrest, right? So where is the respiratory center of the brain? And we spoke about this, I'm sure, in the respiratory lecture. But the center that causes respiration is in the brain stem, all the way at the back, the brain stem, um, which is the lower part of the brain. And if that's what got whacked or hit really hard, they might be in respiratory arrest. They may stop breathing. They may be alive, not breathing, right? You guys all know how to do rescue breathing. And that would be a case where, you know, that would be appropriate. The last one is a priapism. And that is a, a first of all, the patient will be unresponsive. All right, they will not be smiling. Um, they'll be completely unresponsive. They will have had a head or neck injury, and they will have a persistent erection of the male organ. Um, and it's a sign of a spinal cord injury. And it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. This is a cartoon. This guy's a broken leg. Look at his expression. So it's just a it's just a joke. All right. Uh, this is called the halo sign. So you take a piece of gauze and there's blood pouring out of let's say the ear, and you take a piece of gauze and put it up against the fluid coming out, you'll get this halo sign. The blood will be red, right, in the center, 
and around it, you'll see like a yellowish fluid, and that'll be CSF. So there is a way to know if there is CSF leakage. Um, it should really be told, shown to the emergency room. And there's maybe a chance that, you know, they can get OR to do surgery and to fix the problem. Okay, Cushing's, you gotta know this. Is it possible to be conscious with CFF, CSF? Yeah, unlikely. Cushing's, you gotta know this. So, I, I don't know, it, it's, I don't know why everybody finds it difficult that I have this now image to try to help you. So it's the opposite of shock, okay? And you need to know this because they're gonna ask you questions. You're gonna have to figure out, are they in shock or uh, do they have ICP, which is intracranial pressure, increased intracranial pressure. So it's the opposite effects of shock. Let's talk about shock quickly, right? In the end, late stage, BP is going to drop, yes? Pulse is going to be tachycardic, fast, and respirations are going to be fast. That's shock. Now let's look at Cushing's, and it's called Cushing's triad because you need all three. Tri means three. You need all three things. So ICP, which means intracranial pressure increased. So systolic blood pressure up, 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 high, high, high systolic. Pulse will be bradycardic. That means what? Below 60. Respirations, well, they could be slow or they could be completely irregular. But you need to see all three things. I had a patient, stroke patient, uh, probably a year ago now, and he had Cushing's triad. Okay, he had a systolic blood pressure of like nearly 300, bradycardic in the 40s, and respiratory all over the place. So it's a real thing. You can see it with a head injury. You can see it with a stroke. But only ICP, not shock needs all. Just ICP needs three. You need these three to be cushioned. Yeah. Okay. Pupils. I don't care what the instructors teach you. You don't need a light. You don't need a light. Okay? When I talk about pupils, I'm talking about what size are the pupils when you look at them without shining a light. All shining a light does is tells you if the pupils are reactive or not. So obviously somebody who is dead will not have reactive pupils. But if they seem pretty alive to you, there's a good chance the pupils will be reactive. But I don't care. I really don't care. When I come on a bus and I say, what are the pupils? And I always get the same answer. Oh, I don't have a light. I don't know. Like, okay, get off. Just leave. Go away. Because that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, open the patient's eyes and tell me what do you see. Okay? So here we're just doing two. We'll do some more later. This is called a dilated pupil. Dilated. What does that mean? Bigger than normal. 
you should know this word dilated. We spoke about dilated blood vessels, right? During shock, distributive shock. So same word, dilated, big. Constricted means small or smaller than usual. One of each are unequal pupils. The only way to get one of each is a head injury. There are not yet any drugs that can do that. Okay? So again, pupils, are they equal or are they unequal? These on the screen are unequal. Now, unequal could also be one normal, one constricted, or one constrict, or one dilated and one normal, or one or like this. Any difference? Okay. So that only the only way to get this would be what head injury. We're going to talk about collars and things in the next lecture soon. All right, this is something that you need to know. Children, especially infants, have big heads, way too big, disproportionate to the size of their bodies. Because of that, to put them in the neutral position, you may want to put a towel or a folded sheet or something between the shoulders or on their upper back. This way, the head will open into the neutral position. Cervical collars, we'll play with a little bit. We'll talk about, we'll talk about. This is called a KED. It is no longer used in New York State. Um, there may still be a test question on it. So when is it used? The answer is a patient who is seated. It is used for a patient who is seated. Okay. Patient needs to be stable. The environment needs to be stable. And then we used to use this. We really don't use it anymore. All right, this is for the lifeguards. We don't use this stuff. Done, gone, thank God. I'll talk about it soon in the next lecture. We do not use this. We don't do this. We used to. All right, let's introduce GCS. So many years ago in a town called Glasgow, they wanted to know if a drunk got injured and hurt their head how bad were they? I assume it was for drunks because it was in Scotland. So again, it was invented for head injuries. It was invented to determine how injured was the patient. That's what it was for. We call it GCS. Today, it gets uh, a score is given to every patient, whether they stump their toe or whether they're having a heart attack. We're using GCS on everybody. It's not the best system, but it is a system that has been around for many, many years. And it's a system that is being used to this day. You 
don't need to learn how to do it for EMT school. There are three things, and these are the questions. It's all here on this slide. You don't need to learn it. This is what you got to know, okay? The lowest possible score that a dead guy can get is a three. Okay, that you need to know. The highest possible score for everybody who is, is doing just fine is a 15. So it runs from three to 15. Now, there is a saying that goes like this. If a GCS is less than eight, ventilate. Ventilate means use a BVM. It's it's not like a hundred percent this uh, this statement. It's been around. It's been in EMS forever. I don't. How how do we know what the GCS score is though? So your 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 um, tablet will calculate it for you, or you can learn all this, but you don't need to. Today, the PCR will calculate it. Eye injuries, not doing. Uh, nose and ears, I told you about CSF. Okay, this is another new thing from the state. If somebody loses a tooth, the state would like you to replace the tooth where it came out from and transport it to the hospital in the patient, in putting it back. Um, yeah. We can, we have a mannequin for teeth that we can show you. 